Jesus did not teach a new faith, but the original religion of man. My old friend, the Rishi, never tired of talking about the great master, Jesus. One day he said to me, the Lord's Prayer, as the Christians call it, is the greatest masterpiece of phraseology and condensation ever written, for it embodies the whole of the ancient religion in a few short paragraphs. Take, for instance, the beginning, Our Father, which art in heaven. In these six words, many points in the ancient religion are covered. It first tells us that we are his children. Therefore, all mankind are brothers and sisters. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive others that trespassed against us. These simple words tell us our duty to one another and that we should love one another like brothers and sisters. Again, our father tells us that we should approach him as we would our earthly father with love and confidence. Give us this day our daily bread is another wonderful sentence in far reaching. It tells us that we should avoid greed and the craving to amass wealth and depend on him for our daily needs. He will care for us, thus leaving us free to amass spiritual wealth without anxiety about the material. You will notice, my son, our temple has no wealth, nor have those connected with it any wealth. We depend entirely on what the Heavenly Father sends us day by day through the people. Our faith in him is implicit, so he never allows us to want and he could go on through every sentence of the Lord's Prayer. And today on our next installment, part two of the Lost Motherland of Mew, Hillis and I will be going through the symbols of Mew, the seven colonies of Mew, and the original religion of man. But before we get into the video, just a brief word from one of our sponsors. I am so fortunate to have such great sponsors on this channel. Our sponsors, as well as our patrons, are the people who keep the lights on here at Esoteric Atlanta so I can continue delivering videos to you multiple times a week. I am so lucky to be a part of Gnostic TV, to have a SIA as a sponsorship, and to now be sponsored by the incredible Spooky2 company. Spooky2 is like a rife machine generator to help you in your journey through this human experience. If you want more information on Spooky2 and what it can do for you, there will be a video down in the description box. If you would like to purchase Spooky2, there are a few different discounts codes that you can do, all of which you can, again, find down in the description box below. For the 11 year anniversary of Spooky 2, for particular products that are listed for the anniversary sale, you can get 9% off of these said products by entering Happy Bryce in checkout. For all additional products, the regular products, you can get 5% off by entering Bryce Watson when you check out. Here is a little clip of what Spooky 2 can do for you. Hi, John, Echo, and the Spooky 2 team. This is Kanika here, and I'm here to share not just my and my partner's Spooky 2 journey. Spooky 2 has been superbly special for my partner and I. I'm actually sitting in the scale of field. In our personal experiences, my partner and I have uh, literally gone off all our uh, vitamin and multivitamin multivitamin and mineral supplements. We hardly take them. We used to take them to support and supplement our well-being. But I've been using the daily wellness protocol and my hair has just exploded in its growth. The skin's gotten uh, beautiful. The DH experimental frequencies, I've been experimenting with a lot of them. We have such good strength in our body. We don't fall ill to an extent that my partner has hay fever. Peter, he has hay fever, but this time, I've started using the Immune Super Booster and oh my god, it is magic. Uh, we recently this year purchased the remotes as well. So we use our DNA clipping and we put our clippings in it and uh, it's just been so beautiful and profound and I have always been, so I pray daily, I meditate daily and I've been sitting in the scalar field and meditating and praying and 
my psychic abilities my connection to the divine if i just want to put it in a net nutshell is just increasingly becoming so potent i've been using the 12 strand dna activation as well in the dh experimental frequencies just to see how it goes and the the effects are so magnificent in our, on our physical bodies and our like um, energetic field i'm an energy healer i take clients through um quantum healing sessions while sitting in the field so that they can also i can be a clearer conduit and send these energies as well by pure quantum entanglement right and if people were to not believe this all this physical proof shows what a gem of a product this is i can't like recommend this more to anybody like so yes much love and gratitude thank you for listening and um, i could share so much more but i'd like to wrap this up now thank you Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta in partnership with Hillis. How are you doing today, Hillis? <laughs> I'm doing well today. You know, every time I, I pick up another book of James Choke's word, right now I started the third book, The Children's Unmoved, which we'll talk about next show, but there's always some something fascinating something interesting so yeah I, it, it excites me to even talk about this you know how about you how are you doing today i'm good it's been one hell of a mercury retrograde guys so i i know where where uh, uh mercury is going to retrograde retrograde its own way out of here in like a week or two so just hang tight guys but yes you guys i'm going to be placing our first our part one down in the description box below in case you missed part one today we're going to which was the lost continent of mew today we're going to be talking about the secret symbols of mew the colonies the you know all that kind of stuff after we, we ended last week with the with the catastrophe right the cataclysm that sunk the island of mew in the pacific ocean and for those if you're just tuning in um just a bit a bit of a disclaimer this Mew was a lost continent. We're all familiar with this idea of Atlantis or Lumeria, so but not many people know about Mew. I didn't know about Mew until Hill is brought to my attention. Again, you can watch the first episode from last last week where we talk about James Churchwood's work um, into this this uh, alternative history, if you will. And I just want to give a bit of a disclaimer from Hillis and myself. We spoke about this before we came on air. We are just right now, this is just for entertainment purposes only. Um, Hillis and I do have our own opinions about the validity of this work. I think personally, I believe there's a lot of validity to what uh, James Churchwood discovered. But just for legality reasons, you guys, this is strictly for entertainment. Please get the books, do your own research. This obviously is not the official narrative, but it is interesting nonetheless. And as, as Aristotle said, one of my favorite quotes from aristotle and he said it is a sign of an intelligent mind when you could entertain an idea without accepting it so um for those of you who are very uh you know stuck on what we've been taught in school i just ask you to entertain the idea that maybe none of that's true just maybe what if none of that's true <laughs> 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 For legal purposes, this is all strictly for entertainment purposes, guys. We're just yeah. talking about this for entertainment purposes. Yeah. And so, you know, where we left off, you know, at the destruction of Moo is pretty much how it was submerged. And I'm excited about the upcoming part three because of our special guest we're going to have. And I name a name, but we're just going to have a special guest uh, to help uh, maybe validate or strengthen the validity of what it is that, that we've been reading and what they uh, church we talked about. 
And we talked about how did Mu really survive? And it was through the emperor of Mu to create the seven different colonies. But who was charged with creating these seven colonies? It was the Brotherhood. Can we back up just for a second, just for our audience members, just to recalibrate from... So we had this island of Mu in the Pacific Ocean. And then before that island sunk, um, the emperor sent people out all over the earth, basically, to establish civilizations. They were all... What do you call... I mean, I think I asked you this before, Hillis. Do you call them Muians? The people... You know, Mu that was there. You know, and I've read that. I've, and maybe there'll be a proper term... And uh, the next book that I'm reading now, but I have yet to find a proper term. Well, you know what? I have yet to find a proper term for the the 64 million people who inhabited Mu over that yeah. 70 year period. There has not been a proper term. However, I will say that I did read the first chapter of the next book of the Children of Mu, and he talked about how everyone who uh, I don't want to say a refugee, but everyone who left Mu was uh, was called Mayans. Oh, that's right. You told me that. You did tell me that. That's interesting because we know that you... So we talk we're going about to talk the, about the Mayans. The Yucatan <laughs> Peninsula had a lot of... Infer there was a lot of, of relics and, 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 and artifacts to kind of confirm. So basically, you guys... But, just it, doesn't, but it doesn't even matter if they were in... India, Africa, Egypt, it didn't matter where they were, they were still called Mayan. Right, th right, that's interesting. Well, so you guys, so all these people were, li the, the Garden of Eden, we believe, church would believe this was the Garden of Eden, this was this island on the Pacific Ocean, there was a cat, it was, it existed for 70,000 years, 64 million people lived on this freaking island, all of a sudden in a cataclysm, the island sank, but before it sank, the emperor had sent human beings out to the world to set up civilizations. So that means that every single, following James Churchwood's research, that means that every single human being on this planet comes from, genetically comes from Mew. We all descend out of Mew. And we even talked about at the end of the episode last week, Hillis, which I know this is gonna ruffle some feathers because we've been programmed to believe a certain thing. So again, yeah. just to retain the idea, we're all human beings, doesn't really matter. All the people of Mew were one specific race. And these were white people, with brown hair, brown eyes, olive skin, so like Italian looking, right? right? And so we even talked about how, if we look at survival of the fittest, like when the colony started to spread out, that's when different skin colors started to shift a little bit, different eye colors came into play to adapt to when the poles shifted, because with the cataclysm, guys, we spoke about the potential of the poles shifting, which created, obviously, you know, we had different weather and different areas and that shifted and so it created a different survival tactic for the, the Muians or the Mayans that had gone <laughs> to like Northern Europe and had to adapt to freezing cold or into Africa, you know, so. so exactly. So the abdications of the body. Exactly. You know, and if we give ourselves credit, our bodies are a lot smaller than we give it credit for, you know. 100%. It will survive. And so I know that's going to ruffle feathers to hear that we didn't all originate from black people but actually from white people it doesn't matter to me like no it, that's doesn't, just, matter. it doesn't it doesn't the, the, the devil's in the details it doesn't really matter to me like but that's interesting because it goes completely against what we've been, it's actually the opposite of what we've been taught in our own yeah. um classes so anyway and that, so, yeah and in fact we just want to reaffirm too that every colony of Mo, one of the seven colonies is a descendant of the motherland so in essence, you know, when we get into it more today, in essence, you know, Egypt is an extension of the motherland. India is an extension of the motherland. The Yucatan is an extension of the motherland. China Europe. is an extension America. of the motherland. Yeah. Right, yeah. America is an extension of the motherland. So, so I get it. I understand it. But when you are living then, not knowing and then you come into today's presence, you, there was all this misinterpretation that happened. When you have this misinterpretation, it, 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 le it leads from one thing to another. And this is when, you know, we get into some of the Osirian religion. Um, but we'll talk more, more about that later. 
and it, it causes it's called it's caused so much friction between different races and and ethnic backgrounds quote unquote because we all of a sudden after all this history was forgotten we saw ourselves as different from each other instead of understanding we're actually all from the same place that's exactly. all it is. we're just all for it. and we and our body is just an adaption to wherever our our line of the family ended up you know so so yeah so that's where we're starting off today the mew has Mew has sunk to the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. We've got all these colonies of all these. I kind of like Mewians better for some reason. I'm like Mewians. The Mewians. Yeah, Mewians. Yeah, but but just just keep it in line with the text, you know. Yeah, Anyone lion. that has left the island of Mu uh, is Mayan. So. Yeah. Yeah. So we're talking about also, Mayans today. Not the yeah. All right. Mayans and religion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so we've got, so now let's, so who are the people we, we, we talked about last week that the reason why James Churchwood even went on this wild expedition, this goose chase of trying to figure out is because he was in India around the turn of the century or late 1800s, where he had the serendipitous um, luck and fortune of befriending an Indian who was one of two or three people who were trained to decipher this old language. And he started telling him about these tablets. And right. I had said last week, what cracked me up because I've spent so much time in India myself is um, India out of all the countries in the world. They are probably the most superstitious people that you will ever meet. I freaking love it. It cracks me up. I love it. Um, and everything's either auspicious or inauspicious. And this guy was, you know, Churchwood's friend, this Indian guy was telling Churchwood, this white dude, this English white dude, like, about these tablets, but no, we can't look at them because they might fall apart. They're really old. And I get that. That's very Indian to be like, no, inauspicious. Like we can't, it's going to fall apart. So Churchwood in his clever brilliance said, well, what if, what if my friend, these tablets are falling apart and are disintegrating and we need to check them and make sure they're okay. And so the friend kind of got a little paranoid. paranoid yeah. And so he pulled them out and that's when they started to translate. When they started translating them, all of a sudden they were both hooked. They like needed to know more. And so they went on this, this wild goose chase, the scavenger hunt to try to find even more of the tablets. So again, just to reiterate you guys, Churchwood was not out to like debunk history. He that was, just kind of yeah. fell on his feet, didn't it? It, it ended up being a passion project. Yeah. I mean, when you when you look at the when you look at everything in its totality, you know, anyone who pursues this has a great passion for you know, like Billy Carson. I know he has like a great passion for, for all of this, and so I, I guess it kind of like just want to jump in because as we talked about, you know, last episode we briefly talked about the Brotherhood of the Naptos, which is the religious set or part of Mu. The, priest, the priesthood of the music. priesthood, if you will. That's to, what those to tablets think. are called the noctal the noctal tablets. Um exactly. that everything down. Yeah. And they're also known as the sacred writings or the sacred mysteries of Mu. This is what they're they've been changed throughout history. And this is why a lot of healers that I know today are creating mystery schools. You know, that this is where the term birth from. But reading this it gives the mystery school a whole other uh meaning because as we move through this you'll understand why and how everything was changed and because it was changed you know everything from the the move from the original religion of Mu to the osirian religion to the israelites to the religion we have today anything of great knowledge was held secret by the high priest or the emperors of that or of particular times but in Mu, everyone was privy to this information everyone understood science and religion they went hand in hand there was no separation and every time i say that i always think of the term because i heard it growing up especially if you're in high school you you hear it in history class you hear it in social studies you hear it in in, in very in in light classes to where you always hear church and state is always separated and it brought to my it brings it to my awareness of, of the purpose of this separation and so that way this high level of information 
can be uh, can be kept separate away from everyone else who may not have the wisdom or knowledge to grasp that. And even Moses, who was a master, was able to translate this information, but we'll get into Moses in a little bit. But what really set the foundation for the Buddhahood, the Nagos, uh, the religion, is their seven commandments. And I want to read those. And as I read them uh, before, and I read them again, that they were very profound and yet simple. This is what I like about their culture. The culture was very simplified. There was nothing that was overdone, over-specified. It was, let's keep it simple so everyone can understand, so everyone can follow. And you have to understand during this time, everyone was taught to worship the symbol and not worship the symbol in the terms that we understand worship today. It was for them to give them focus on the energy to embody that in which they've put their focus and vision on. So to understand the Nazis, we have to understand the, the seven commandments. And the seven commandments go as such, this being the first. Man was taught there was a supreme being, infinite and all-powerful, that there was a creator who created all things and above and below. That was man created by the Almighty, having been created by him, and was the son of that this almighty was heavenly father so we already established that the creator heavenly father which is incited or recited in the lord's prayer that jesus created and we can all we'll get into the lord's prayer later and how he took the teachings of mood and simplified them in, into these prayers that he wrote and then second commandment was when man was created, the creator placed within the body of man a spirit or soul which never died but continued through eternity. So we already know that we this is an empty vessel, that we embody this vessel for the sole purpose of evolution. So creator put the soul, spirit, in the body. And then in the third commandment was when man was created, it was ordained that his material body should return to the earth from which it was taken. When the material body died, it was released the soul which went into the world and beyond, meaning that we move through this energy that we, once the body is returned, to the earth, which is one of the primary forces, it can return and then the spirit will be free to do what it does naturally. You know, I will say though, H Hillis, this is, this seems like common sense for a lot of people who have spent their lives studying spirituality, but I will tell yeah. you something that's been incredibly shocking to me is so many people do not understand that their body and their soul are two different things and that the soul right. body is just the temporary experience of the soul. Right. And so like in the Bible where it talks about the resurrection of people being resurrected, so mm. many people are so completely just don't understand that. They think it, the body is literally going to zombie itself out of the earth. They don't <laughs> understand it's about the soul yeah. resurrecting. The body is just, and so and I, and I say this a lot in, in, in um, you know, in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, which I was telling you, Hillis, I believe Patanjali was basically writing down everything that they're taught, you know. And he said, right. man suffers because man doesn't understand basically what yeah. the people of Mu knew, that their soul was right. eternal, the body right. was not. Right, and exactly. Man suffers because man thinks that his body is who he is. But his body is destined to die. That's you know, spoil alert. That's what happens to all of us. <laughs> you know, if you didn't, sorry if I had to spoil that for you. But we all have the same, 
you know, Death Be Not Proud by John Donne. You know, we all have the same ending here. Um, right. Authors and Kings all have the same ending. And so I will say that 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 to me has been very shocking since I've been on YouTube. Because I spent most of my life, my adult life studying this Eastern spirituality. But I was, I was per, I've been perplexed at how people do not understand that their body is not what's eternal. Their soul is what's eternal. So anyway, I just wanted to point that out. So carry on, my friend, carry on. <laughs> And in the fourth commandment, it says it was thoroughly, thoroughly instilled into his mind that the Heavenly Father was great love. And that great love ruled the universe and never died. He was taught that love of the Heavenly Father was far greater than the love of his earthly father, who was a reflection of his Heavenly Father. And, and it goes on to say more, but I'm just going to leave it at that. So that way you understand the sense of, you know, when we often think of something outside of ourselves, this is what we relate to, that, there's, that the source creator energy is outside of us. But yet the energy is still contained within, the, within us because this is what we have uh, been created from. And in the fifth commandment, it goes on to say that he was taught that all mankind were created by the same heavenly father therefore all mankind was his brothers and sisters and shall be treated in such in all his dealings with them so basically the golden will do unto others as you have them do unto you and in the six and actually i thought it was seven and seven so it's only six so forgive me for that and in the six commandment but finally finally he was taught that his duties on earth how he should live to prepare himself to become fit to pass into the world beyond where he was called he was a spiritual reminder that he must follow the paths of truth love charity and chastity with perfect love and confidence in the heavenly father and so i just want to briefly touch on each one of those really quick so he talks about truth. We know what truth is. We understand and know what love or unconditional love is. We understand what charity is. But this is where a lot of people get hung up with charity. It's not only speaking of material charity where we give of money, give of possessions, things like that. But in terms of charity, he's also talking about part of yourself, part of your soul, part of your time, part of your energy, part of yourself. That's what is referenced when speaking of charity in this aspect. And chastity is not, you know, in the terms of chastity in, in the terms that we know. Chastity is is in terms of discipline or in terms of reverence or in terms of, of really understanding what it is you have to offer, really self-empowerment and self-discipline to allow for the energy of self to really flow and uptake and then uh, in that space of in of being shared, you know? We have the same thing in uh, what's called brahmacharya in Sanskrit. And basically, brahmacharya, basically, tr same thing, tra translates to chastity, but it doesn't right. actually mean that. What it means is, like, in the intimate sense, if you're going around just being intimate with every Tom, Dick, and Harry on the planet, then you're, you're not, you're, you're, you're not, you're not, holding your own energy sacred right like when you are okay. intimate with somebody you're sharing karma with them and so there should be an understanding a self-awareness a sovereignty a control within your own bodily function to then decide who to share that power with in a powerful way and that's kind of what when i read that i was like oh that's brahmacharya that's the same thing that we talk about i tell my students it basically means don't be a slut like just, just don't you know like well, yeah, that's what it means today. But, you know, I also understand it to be what you just said, but also in the terms of Cassidy, it's really... And it, it goes back to the discipline, and not just in the, in the sexual sense, but in every sense, you know? You know, you know it's, it's when I... It's like when you do a fast, you know, when you do a diet, when you do those things, it's, it's, it's the Cassidy, it's the restricting the the discipline and in, in in owning that energy and owning and owning yourself you know 
it talks about the sutras too along what line what you're saying that within the pursuit of spirituality and spiritual wholeness it takes effort and like what you're saying like like i you know it takes that that for me like my discipline i get up at 3 30 4 o'clock every morning for brahmacharya it's not that i love doing that but that's like the how i'm trained to then do my practice right. and have my meditation and that is that takes effort it takes that integrity to work on your discipline and i think that and i don't know hillis i feel like today in modern spirituality in the pop spirituality the pop culture people don't understand that they think spirituality is just all light and love and doing what feels good and but they don't <laughs> realize actually spirituality is putting a lot of effort and being yeah. you know and being okay with being uncomfortable and the discipline of it all and so yeah okay cool awesome yeah and so what i want people to really understand that as we get into some of the symbology of mo which we're going to get into in just a moment is that the symbols were designed for us to focus on what they represented in terms of embodying that energy inward. And if I focus on the circle, which is known for the deity of Ra, the sun god, or the universal god, heavenly father, that energy, it was taught that we focus on that energy and bring the energy inward and not idol worship in which we know of it today, which, you know, as we move through this, you will understand that the extravagance and is, is the piece that really corrupted the religion and really got corrupted, uh, in Egypt when we, when we get to that point. I really want to, so people I want to break this down so that when we get there, you truly understand what the Mu religion was. And I wanted to show you this because this is Mu's, uh, the cosmic diagram that they have. And I want, I'm going to break this down for you guys. And so basically, it looks like a blue ribbon. What this page do you want? Page, uh, page 15. Yeah. yeah. This one, guys. But basically, it looks like a blue ribbon. And, and, and I'm just going to break this down for you to where the triangles are really, where did it go? So basically when you see the, the, and look, I'm funny that you're saying like I'm actually direct. So when you see the, the rays or the lines coming down, those are actually the sun rays coming down from the deity. And then the scallops that are on the outside are the 12, represent the 12 paths or the 12 different ways, uh, of the religion of the, of one's path. And then the triangles, which is in how we will understand the Merkaba but as above is below. And then the center is the deity, the Ra, God energy. You guys can get the book, read more into that, but this is just a quick summary of it. So that way you understand the path in which they allow themselves to be on. But when I first saw like, this is a blue ribbon. And, and so, right, so now, first place. Then I understand that the, 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 the mental, uh, description of that and why they chose that as the blue ribbon but their theology was a monotheistic theology and so they only believed in that one god the and then there was variations of ra the sun god the energy the one and all but and then they had the temples that were dedicated to him but it was a monotheistic belief that it was one and only one but he was in so many things. He was the giver of life, creator of life. And we'll get into that uh, as we move through the symbols, especially the story of the tree of life and the serpent, which has been thoroughly uh, misinterpreted. Yes. The I want to show people a Merkaba too, um, a rock as above, so below. I knew I had one somewhere. Um, yeah, mine is on the other side of the room. I can't get to it now. <laughs> I've got all my, my treasures. I'm like a little kid. I got my treasure of rocks right here. Yeah. Yeah, so that's so, guys. If you ever yeah. see that, like a if somebody has it on their table or something, and that's what it means. That's that's the mark. Yeah. So. And so there's one thing that was real interesting about the the one of the attributes of the deity is that there's always seen as as two principles, one being of ancient uh, conception to where it embodies both male and female energy. And that form is the circle with a line through it, down the middle, vertically. And it represented both male and female energy. 
and in that it uh, translates to Luhan meaning two and one. So if you guys have ever done research about guys of other, other cultures, this this I can't remember this guy's name, but there's one guy in particular in the uh, African culture where this one guy is, and I'm sure it's in South America as well, that there's one guy that's able to change their sex. There's one in Hinduism too, and I can't remember the name of it, but there is one um, god that can go back and forth between the two. And I will say too, guys, the male and female and is the Shiva and the Shakti as well. It's the uh, the the material and the uh, and the spiritual. It's the uh, aponic and pranic, the aponic energy being feminine, the pranic being masculine. That is in both of us. That that we both those energies we carry within our bodies, regardless of what biological gender you are, you carry both the aponic and pranic. So this is the marriage of the two energies within within yourself. Exactly. And you know, I don't know why I did not write it down, but there was. Uh, the meaning of the circle that we just talked about. Then there's also the square, and then there's also the triangle. I'm sure it's in my notes, but the the different meanings of each one. But I just want to, and what I'm being guided to share with you because I because I feel it's important because this is one of the reasons why people are here is to share the symbology of how the cross began, and so the cross is a symbol of the of the four primary forces. So you have just a regular regular cross, you know, standard cross. Well well started off as, you know, you know, evenly distributed, but as time moves on they moved the horizontal bar higher. But the cross started out as the four primary forces, which are the forces that were charged in creating the universe whether if it's the simple four elements, air, earth, fire, water, and whether if it was spirit energy, the four premier forces are not defined. You guys understand that they're not defined. It's assumed that it's air, earth, water, fire, especially if you're familiar with alchemy. That's how they were uh, connected. And so what's even more fascinating about this, because if you go through history and you look at pictograms and symbols and things of that nature, you then begin to understand that they had to put movement, represent movement in the symbology. And everything in Mu moved from east to west with, with the motion of the sun, the motion of the deity, which is also why when you go back to Japan, the land of the rising sun, they talk about the east of them, which was Mu. So that was the original land. Garden of Eden, whatever the, the birthplace of all life on, on the planet. And so when you talk about the cross, you then talk about also the second symbol that they talk about, which is the cross inside of a circle which represents the deity, the universe, urging the four primary forces to move and create and bring order to the chaos. Because at this time, before the four primary forces, there was chaos. So they were charged with bringing order to this energy. And then as it is depicted, uh, as you move through, you then begin to see that they had to, they added uh, I'm trying different lines, and I'm trying to find it here. So if you're looking through the book, Bryce, it's page 40. Yeah. So then, yeah, thank you. So switch it over just a little bit. Yeah. So then that way, so now it brings me to the next point, which is now we talk about swastika and you see that symbol and it's and it's filled with so much hatred so much hatred <laughs> that we just fill it with that but the original design of this was to create the feeling of movement of the four primary forces along with the deity and so when you add those lines those lines go from east to west creating movement it's like it's, and, a it's like they're like the pinwheel yeah. exactly 
And they and so the four primary forces are also known as the four builders. And there's a couple other names that they are referred to. And when you have this energy, when you have this description, when you begin to know what it means, it, it really sets the tone for really understanding how things were created and how things were moved. And the four primary forces are depicted in numerous ways throughout the book in the in uh Mexi in the Mexican tablets and Nevins tablets, you see them depicted in many ways. And each edition creates something new, something else, something different with that. And when you have these little nuances, it creates a whole new meaning. And what I want to show you, if I can find it, I don't know why I didn't mark it. Is I want? Oh, you know, I think I showed it to you guys last time about the the symbol of the First Nation, but that's not important now. <laughs> I, I kind of want to stay on, on on this topic. And so, when you have this energy, and then it evolves into what we know as seeing you know, wings in different cultures, and then we get into how uh, uh, Quetzalcoatl was created, the seven headed serpent. So the seven-headed serpent was also known as creation, but he was also depicted with wings and feathers and that energy of seven. And so if you guys know, and I we talked about it in the previous episode where seven is the is the energy of change and transformation, and this is what Mu was known for was the sacred seven. And the in and the Sacred writings uh, of Mu. <laughs> oh, so I'm just like taking over, Vice. Oh, like, I love it. I love it because you you're the one that's really done a lot of of. Um, I'm just looking at Ganesh here, you know, and these symbols, and of course, um, my experience in India with my favorite, well, my one of my favorite deities is actually Hanuman. I talk about Hanuman a lot, um, and I know the Ramayana is is referencing Mu as well. So you know, a lot of these older religions. Um, and it's interesting because we think of Christianity as being a new religion, but actually yeah. what he's saying in this book is Jesus or Yahshua was actually teaching an old religion. He was teaching a very was old religion. original religion. He what? He was teaching the original religion. Which is not what the church is teaching now at all. No, no. Not at all. And, and so, which kind of brings me to this next point in, in how Egypt and Mu are connected. And so if anyone knows anything about Egypt, their uh, symbol was the beetle, the dung beetle. And the reason why they chose the dung beetle is because of how it can take a pile of mud and uh, roll it into a ball and life uh, be uh, <laughs> life comes from this ball of mud. However, the same thing is true for the story of the Garden of Eden the story of Mu, the story of uh, the serpent and water, the cosmic story of the tree of life. And so I'm, I'm going to do this best I can from memory without trying to, to get uh, from my notes. And this is one of the reasons why we knew that Mu was, uh, that we knew that Mu was created in Egypt and Atlantis were colonies is because of this story and in this story you have uh the water which is represented by the serpent and then you have the land which is represented by the tree of life yeah. well, follow me as i as i tell this story so this so when we hear the story of adam and eve, adam and eve in the garden eve is the representation of the water feminine Which feminine energy yeah exactly cosmic eggs you know energy and so when you have the four primary forces or the deity in this sense the sun energy eats up the air moves through the air kisses and touches the water mind you at this time there's nothing on the planet there's no land mass nothing on the planet except water and so as the water heats up, gas is created, minerals are created, and solid mass begins to form over an extended period of time. 
And in this extended period of time, you have begun to create life. And but you have to know to this life. So this is where the cosmic age come in. So you have the sun kissing the water, creating the cosmic eggs. Life. Then you know the and, Gnostics, the original students of Yahshua had the cosmic egg everywhere. They understood this. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. And so so then you have the serpent, who I feel was misrepresented in the Bible. Me too. One hundred is, is the protector of the cosmic eggs, the life. And there's a picture of that with there's plenty of pictures in this book where it's depicted the, the serpent is wrapping around the eggs, keeping them safe and protected. And this is where uh, in the Mayan belief in the in the South American culture where you have Quetzalcoatl, the seven-headed serpent, also protecting the eggs, protecting life. So there's all this representation of this life being protected, of this serpent and the tree of life. It's not you know, the Bible's interpretation of, you know, good versus evil, you know, that's what is made up. It is about how the serpent is of a protector, a knowledge keeper of this precious life that is yet to be born. And this is how we get the story of Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden, and the story of the Tree of Life, and the story of uh, the knowledge tree. Yeah. You and then also, too, I'm just thinking about it. Sorry to mean the question, but I'm just thinking about it. You know, uh, it was, uh, uh, oh God, it was something that Billy Carson said. I watched one of his things and this was my, and I can't think of it. I had a brain for why can I not think of this? But it was, but it was in, in reference to how, uh, the story of Adam and Eve and how the Anunnaki, uh, did create it. So, oh, geez. I'm going to have, we're going to have to say this to have to remind us what this was, this whole Adam and Eve story. Um, well, I want to, when, when we look at this this serpent too, you guys, I'm going to stand up for a second. When we look at it, and I talked about this with my friend with Cindy the other day. We're looking at that in an interpersonal, the inner life. Um, can you still hear me if I stand up? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At the base of your belly, the base of your pelvic floor, like where my hip bones are right in here, you have the, which is the, the womb for a woman, but for all people, there's the Kundalini energy. This, that's where the Kundalini energy basically is created. And as you start to strengthen your body and work and, you know, that's why spirituality and exercise go hand in hand. Exercise is the root word of exorcism. You get hot and sweaty, you get uncomfortable, you get the pelvic floor strong. That, that serpent, Kundalini is represented by a serpent. It starts to wake up and move. And it starts to move up Shashuna, which is your spine, up all the way to the top of the head. That's why Patanjali, the writer of the Yoga Sutras, even though he was a scientist, he's often depicted as having the, sa the snake's head coming up above his head because he's awoken that that understanding that knowledge that creation of what we call enlightenment or um you know that prativa that flash of illumination which i think the illumination is also what most of the people in mu were already illuminated there were, were no secrets there were no mysteries because no, they knew it was already. All shared they knew you know, it was shared, yeah and and when we have and i just want to add to that when we talk about the uh case of Kawada, the seven headed serpent it also refers to the seven chakras the mm -hmm. seven this the seven that so yeah. the seven is very prominent in that space and so it brings me to the next space because you know we had we talked about you know the Nagos going to establish colonies and one of the main colonies was egypt and this is where the Osirian religion was born out of. And I just want to read this for you guys really quick. So Thoth founded the colony at the Nile Delta near the end of the, the mouth of that river. And it was his father. So it was 6,000 years prior to that. So this is how Thoth began to come in, in into the bigger picture. As he was established this religion there with his with his priest, his father who was a priest, 
And then from there, it was like 6,000 years before Osiris. It's, uh, exactly. That's off, guys. The, the guy who wrote the Emerald Tablets. We've gone through them. I'm like, that's, now look, what's that? <laughs> what's that? What's that? <laughs> so he founded the, so he was connected with his father, who was a priest of Mu, and then he took all his teachings from Egypt, and Egypt and Atlantis, so he used them back and forth for a time. And in that period, you have to understand that he, that his father was the priest, and to him they were taught, they were teaching the purest form of Mu religion, the original form of, of Mu religion. But it wasn't until the 11th through 18th dynasty where things began to be convoluted, where they began to uh, teach idolatry, where they, you know, beginning to worship false idols, animals, all these things, all the elements, everything that had not to do with the original deity, the, the Ra. And so if you go back through the book, you can also see Isis and how she was represented and how they talked about uh, the bird, Oh geez, I can't think of the bird, but the her particular symbol, the bird that she was depicted with, yeah, even on the thrones, and this was when Osiris was still in charge on his throne. If you look, there is a uh, uh, open square, a square within a square, and that represented the four buildings, the four primary forces. So this was throughout their kingdom, and if you look at next, we have one here. But even if you look at some of the temples and some of the drawings, they talk about their pillars. And this is actually one of my necklaces. It says a Jedi, D-J-E-D-I, a Jedi necklace. You know, it's known with the Egyptian energies. Yep. It stands for the pillar of power. Yep. But it also, in this case, it also represents the four primary forces. And almost on every uh, temple, every project every entryway there was some representation of the four pillars or the four primary forces the four builders whichever one you want to choose and it meant that this building was established by them and protected by them so when you see that in in old uh, Egypt or in old writings ancient writings that's what that meant it was to be known that they were establishing that place and it was protected by the four primary force. They go through that. That's also, guys, I will place the playlist, the Magdalene, um, my Magdalene playlist, but the Magdalene manuscript, they go through, because, you know, Magdalene and Yahshua themselves were not actually Jewish, they were Egyptian, which is another thing that the church changed. And they talk about all of that a lot. And people see these, like, obelisk and call the you know for me like that's the shashumna that's what you know that's the same thing it's the shashumna as they say in sanskrit which is the power of energy and so you know we see how even today people are still so conditioned even in the discloser or truth or community people are conditioned to protect the false teachings of the church and destroy the genuine teachings of the motherland and that's right. what really gets to me because like the, the the genuine teachings of Mu and of yoga it's very a very peaceful it's very much like you respect each other we all come from the same source we're all brothers and sisters but yet this false teaching of the church is teaching people to go violent on the peaceful right. teachings and in order to protect the more um well we also have Burma to thank for that do what we have Burma to thank for that Burma, for yeah Burma, Burma gets the gets the blame. Yeah, no, there, there's a section in here that, that I will read where it talks about Burma because remember last time we talked about how cannibalism and savagery started in yeah. Burma because of the submergence of Mu because of the condition of the planet at that time. It started there, and there's proof of that. There's evidence of that, but you know, no one talks about that. But moving forward, after uh, Osiris passed, his legacy was the Osirian religion. But then other priests began to take over, and as they took over, they introduced what they called extravagance. 
you know, the idolatry, the, uh, the idol worship, the animal worship, all these other forms of worship. And it was Moses, who was the son of uh, uh, Israelite and possibly the son of uh, Hephaestus, I'm sorry, Hesphat, sorry. <laughs> and who was an Egyptian princess. <laughs> yes, Egyptian. So, so, but yet, because of that, and there's no admission to his Egyptian half, but he was still an Israelite slave. Yeah, so I'm not. I'm not a huge fan of Moses because of my my research into him. He. Uh... But, but this this is what is funny to me because there, he only mentions or talks about Moses a little bit here in this book. Talks about how Moses is a master and, and understanding the Moo language. Yeah, he was a master warlock. That's what Mo the word the name Moses actually means, master warlock. Oh, see, I didn't know. That's what Moses means, master warlock. Yeah. And so as he, as they make the exodus, you know, because of Moses, and it was determined that Moses wrote part of the first book of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't know how many people know that, how many people were aware of that. I wasn't. But when I, when I read about that, it, but it made me sit up a little bit because of this individual who wrote this book, but yet, he interpreted the sacred writings of Boo perfectly because only masters can interpret this writing. But when, you know, thousands of years later, after he departed, you then have, you know, his, I don't want to say counterparts, but I guess that's a better, you know, like a better his counterparts or equals of today. Yeah. Interpret all the information and finish or rewrote the book. And, this is how we got the Christianity of today because of what Moses wrote that was misinterpreted. But then, well, I, you know, I, in my study of the Old Testament and the missing book and the, miss, the missing books of the Old Testament tell a fa fabulous story, um, fabulous in, in the sense that it's it's juicy. The whole Old Testament is a grimoire. And so and what does a grimoire mean? And we I say this all the time. I know, I know. It's a spell book. And so <laughs> there's that's what because people are like, what do you mean by grimoire? I'm like, it's a spell book. It's all a spell book. Yeah. And so um what I think Moses did too, reading the missing books of the Bible and putting it all together, I think that Moses, um, because Moses means master warlock, and all of the original depictions of Moses, he was not liked by many people because he would do black magic on people um when we look at the plagues of england that happened under moses it was all done and so when we look at magic and this i think it also comes maybe from the chaos and the catastrophe where people started to get into this idea of self self-satisfying um we're given he probably has, was given all this information that other people didn't have but he ended up using it converting uh -huh. it um, because when you get to the missing books of Moses, it's wild. It's wild what um, what was written down in those books. And in the missing books of the Old Testament, we see like that's where we learn that Moloch is Yahweh, and that a lot of these names that people have for God are actually like deemed as like lower spirits, demonic. So it's just fascinating. And so yeah. I don't necessarily think that it was Moses' like descendants or counterparts who messed up the translation. I think in a lot of ways, Moses intentionally wrote things down wrong because he was hoarding information for himself. That's just my, from my research into the missing books of the Bible, my research into Moses, that dude right. was wicked. He was wicked. Right. Right. Um, but this also brings us to Jesus. There's not a lot uh, in the book about him and, and the symbols of mood per se, but if anyone knows if, who's done you know, just high level research. You understand that Jesus had this missing period, this missing time of his life. And so this goes back to, and obviously at this time, you know, Mu is gone. Colonies have been settled. Mountains have been raised. Yep. Keep all of this in mind. So in this time where he's gone missing, he's going to go study in, uh, in Tibet in this energy. Yep. Yeah. So where the sacred tablets, the sacred writings of Mu were kept. He studied and studied it and, and buffeted that back to him 
when he was full grown. Yeah. You have to understand that in his knowing that he taught the original religion. So how did all of this get misconstrued? How did this get mi you know, misinterpreted? And I want to find this section. I know it's, I believe it's on page 173, where they talk about the religion of India, but there's this section where they talk about Burma. Um, and I believe that's on... 175. And so reason why part of this, well, most of this ended up in Burma, in India, which is where Jesus learned all of this, is because of, uh, I'm just going to read this one sentence, the Brahmins may reserve uh, for their initiates an esoteric and more ample than the name Manu. And when we talk about the word Manu, they talk about the inscription A-U-M that's written on the inside of a triangle that has baffled scholars and scientists for years. And to and me, this is I, where... Just, huh? just, just sorry to interrupt you first. The Brahmin, so when he says the Brahmins may reserve for their initiates an esoteric more ample um, than that given by Manu. Brahmins, just so you guys know, for those who are not familiar with Indian culture, Brahmins are the upper, it's the priestly caste. So yes. even in India today, like my teacher's a Brahmin, you know, like I will never be a Param guru because I'm not a Brahmin. So that's very Indian. And Brahma, if we're looking at the Hindu trinity, Brahma is one. It's Brahma, Shibu, and Shiva, and Vishnu are the three. Like we have Father, Son, Holy Ghost. So Brahmins are of Brahma. So just so that for our, our friends, if you read this book, when he references the Brahmins, he's talking about the priestly caste. Right. And so... In that sense, if you look at the word A-U-M, this is where I believe the word Amen comes from. And also, if anyone's familiar with uh, plant medicine ceremonies, plant medicine uh, rituals, you know, when we, when the shaman gives uh, a prayer, and at the end, the males say, Aho, and the women say, aha, this is also a take on that. So this in itself is affirming or reaffirming the prayer that was spoken, whether it be for yourself or for others. So this is where, this is part of the reason why I believe that most of the information, you know, by way of Mu, by way of Egypt, by way of India, by way all the way up to Tibet and the, the information ended up there because they needed a safe place to keep this information because those who had it obviously didn't want anyone didn't want people to share it because why else, you know, probably at the time mountains were raised and still raised. So why and I'm sure at the time it, I'm not sure. I, I, there's no way to really say whether the mountains raised when they brought that information over or not me but i just leave it to you to do your your formal research but when you look at the the total scope of why everything was the way that it was and why it was interpreted the way that it was it was some of it may have been ill intended some of it may have not been but when you do the research when you understand when you read the information that's out there and draw your own conclusions based on your own personal experience things begin to make a little bit worse yeah and I will say, I, I, my theory, my opinion on, because this kind of goes for the law of one, um, when when you, so even though we perceive Mu to be maybe, we perceive Mu as being as, they were, they were technically more advanced than we were, but yes. they were more peaceful than we were. And I think sometimes we see that as more enlightened. And yes, they knew more. But what happens, if you read the law of one, when consciousness evolves, it almost has to drop back a little bit. It's like um, a boomerang, right? Like, or a, uh, what's Mercury Rich? Slingshot. Slingshot, that's it. You have to pull it back before you can sling it forward. And so what happens when we came into third density is that we now are in the density of what they call choice. And that's the density what we're in now. And, and that's where it polarizes. So it becomes yeah. service to others or service to self, the dark or the light. 
And, and, and so this makes sense to me after being a student of the law of one and then reading this stuff that all of a sudden this very peaceful religion for 70,000 years was like understood by everyone. All of a sudden there was a cataclysm, pole shift, changing timelines, now bumping up into third density, where now human beings who come from the same genetic place of Mu now have to come into friction. So now yeah. we have choices. Now we have service to self. And if you look at the service to self polarity, um, which is what I think Moses was and what we know, like a lot of the controllers of the world are, because a lot of the controllers of the world do know this information. Um, they, what they do in service to self, the dark side is that they hoard information and they keep it a secret for themselves. They well, don't yeah, that's why we take you know, if you read part of the, I think it was, don't I forget what I read, but this is how, you know, secret societies were birthed and things like that. And because, you know, when I read about the Osirian religion, the you know, how it was evolved, you know, to hoard information between the eleventh and eighteenth dynasty at the pinnacle, that this information was only reserved for the emperors and the high priests, not regular priests. Uh -huh, priests. Yeah, yeah. Well, in the and, service to, to others, they share. I mean, look at us. You you found you. You called me. You were like, let's talk about this. Service to others of the light. We share everything. Right. Exactly. So, now, remember, guys, and this is one thing I want to, because everybody who knows about the controllers of the world and knows what they do, they want to, like, go vigilante and destroy. And it's like, no, 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 no. The darkness cannot create anything. Only the light can create. Only the light can create. The sun came down to the water, right? Only the light can create. So our job, what, what the darkness does is they take this information and they invert it. They invert it for their own selfish uses. Our job of the light is to heal that and bring it back to its original template. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And you know, and and I, and I guess it's, it's perfect timing because I want to also bring up, because I finally found it in my notes. <laughs> I love I love a good Mercury retrograde, guys. I love a good Mercury retrograde. We're like, where is it? Where is the thing? <laughs> uh, well, we talk about the basic shapes. So the circle, the square, and the triangle. And I just want to read those to you really quick. So the circle in itself that I talked about is the, is the deity. So this is on page 70, where the circle is the picture of the sun and what's the symbol and the, and the symbol of the infinite one as it embraced all his attributes, the deity. And this being a monotheistic symbol, it was considered the most sacred of all, of all symbols. And so this, you know, kind of speaks to me about why I love the circle so much. You know, in, in almost every logo that I've done for myself, you know, it's always some sort of circular <laughs> uh, impression. That really, that's a, that's a, did yeah. you know when you designed that, that that looks like the yeah. Mew? No. Uh -uh. Like the four elements not spinning, like... Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Um, and so, go on to what we talk about, the equilateral triangle. Where are you, Mr. Triangle? There you are. The equilateral triangle has a dual significance, depending on where and how it is used. Their origin dates back to the primitive land, a primitive man, the version of the three lands. So if you guys remember that in the last episode, I talked about how Mu was divided into three sections. Yeah. This is also a reference to the three sections of Mu and, Mu and the 10 tribes of 64 million people living on this big, massive island. And so you have to understand that also the three lands in which it was formed of you was in the West. So, like I said, talking about Japan, it was to the East. So we have the land of the rising sun. The lands of the West were considered a huge continental island, uh, small ones separate from the big ones and narrow seas. And so even goes into where it talks about the Egyptian canal. So there's these different land masses that make up Mu. And then it uh, goes into the other, to the other uh, definitions of what the equilateral triangle mean. And then lastly, you know, is one of my favorites is the four-sided square. And not, not the pyramid, but just the regular shape of the square. Whereas if the four-sided square compiles 
of the trilogy of the first and the original sacred symbols. The square was selected as the conventional symbol of the earth, apparently for two reasons, to prevent it from being confounded with the sun, whose picture was a circle, and the purpose of teaching primitive man the cardinal points, north, south, east, and west. Also, as known as the great uh, four pillars, the primary force, the great builders. So it's in reference to that energy. And when we think about how we use them, we don't think about them in this way. And so, you know, when we go back to the foundations, what everything means, this is it. This is the foundation of, of truth. And it, it just is amazing to me and how all of this stuff comes about, you know? Yeah. 100 percent you don't you don't need i mean i've i'm very anti-religion um to me the oh god isn't religion i'm i it's you know your your spirituality it's, it's all within you and that's one of the most beautiful things about rediscovering this work is like no this is what our our collective ancestors knew this you you're it you're the temple you're the creation you're it so is everybody else so right. yeah and also, too, want to talk about this because people, you know, always have this association with the lotus, and no one really knows what the lotus means. So according to well, Mo, yoga. yeah, yeah, if the lotus was the first flower to beautify the earth, the first flower being the first flower in Mu, the land where first where man first appeared on earth. Mu and the lotus were naturally symbolic syn uh, syn uh, synonyms and a mark of love and mourning. The Egyptians, and after the destruction of Mu, never depicted the lotus as an opening uh, living flower, but always closed in death. The lotus is a prominent figure in the carvings and adornments of all ancient temples and except for Egypt. And so I just want you guys to understand that when Mu was thriving and alive, you always saw the lotus open in as many ways or any or any form thereafter. But when you saw it closed, that meant the the Mu was closed, and it was closed definitely when you saw it in other uh, in other colonies. So when you saw it, when they talked about Mu, this was one of the ways of Closed lotus, and there was other symbols I'm not going to get into uh, right now that are in this book. You guys just have to get it. So that way, when you see symbology of today, you'll be able to understand how it was used and why it was used, especially, you know, resulting in the most controversial one, the swastika and the cross. Yeah. yeah. You know, I and, the, uh, the lotus flower, that's crazy. It was the first flower. You know, we always say the lotus flower represents yoga because it has to go through the mud and the muck in order to bloom. Yeah. Like, go through right. the shit in order to like actually find that that moment of, of peace. So that's that's pretty powerful. Yeah, it was the first flower. And what it, and going back to the cross, we have the cross which represents the four primary forces, but that wasn't the cross that was initiated so if you go back and if you that wasn't the uh, the cross that was originally depicted when jesus was nailed to the cross when Je when jesus was nailed to the cross it was a t-shaped cross yeah it was a, it, it was apparently they they, they executed on like call like it was a pole right right and so when you see that you know depending on what you watch the way you do your research i talked about this last episode it was is the symbol of Tao, the symbol of resurrection. So necessarily, as we talked about earlier, resurrection is not necessarily always resurrecting the, the physical body, but it also just mean the resurrecting of the soul. So there's all these symbolisms, all the symbology that surrounds us, and we always take it for face value, but when we actually look at it and understand it, we can see the face value of, of what it is. And one of the things that I wanted us to talk about too, that we also talk about for face value is, you know, we talk about the circle, the deity of the sun, it's infinite. But I wanted to also talk about the heretic symbol in, in the Mu language. And if you want to bring that up, that's on page 97. And the heretic uh, letter in, it has two 
I mean, is this one that's open and one that's closed? I'm just going to talk about the one that's closed because the one that's closed is the representation of what we know as the infinity symbol, the infinite symbol. The things never end, but things are always moving in motion. And so I just want to bring that to your attention that some of the symbols that we use and that are popular today have roots in the heretic language of Mu. And when we understand the origin of which things come, we can apply that energy and amplify it even more to our own personal and daily use. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's what I wanted to talk about. That's what was important. That's why I... So on page 95... Uh, you also want to bring up another very common symbol, especially popular among the uh, African American culture. Yeah, especially. Actually, you're not, I pulled it out when we first started. Yep, exactly. And so this symbol is a compromise of, of two symbols. It compromises the deity of Ra, and then it also symbolizes the four primary forces, the cross. And so when you have these symbols together, it represents the the continuation of life, the emergence of life. As as the energy moves through the mouth, it moves through the, the four primary points. And it's in that energy of itself, and it represents the the body. I'm sorry, it represents the spirit triumphing over the body. So yeah. when you have something, make sure that you, you understand what it means and what it means for you. And it is in that essence that this symbol, along with the uh, what is called the tattoo, T A T T U, <laughs> like tattoo, um, also represents the the energy of established. So as I talked about earlier, with the energy of the pillars in Egypt culture, it also means that as well. When we talk about the four pillars, the tattoo to established to to create something uh, to have something of of close value to you, and it's also when you go through the halls of Anamenti, the pillars, the tattoo is there to protect and say that this was established by this energy. So I mean, there's there's a lot here, you guys, and I mean honestly, without Mu and the interpretations of the heretic language and symbols and the meanings. And how it has passed down through the Hopi, the pa the Pueblo, all the indigenous and native cultures. Would we even have this information today? Would it even be relevant? Would we even know of anything unless we're part of some secret society that right. has this information somewhere? You know. I know it's, and I think that's what's killing. I mean, we're coming up to another timeline shift, right? So we're leaving the age yeah. of Pisces into the age of Aquarius, whatever you want to call it. And I think that's what's killing the powers that be is that all this information is coming back out again and more and more and more and more people. Like when I was a kid, to not believe the official n narrative meant that you were kooky. Now I feel like most people know that what we're being taught might not be act. It's interesting. Uh, my boyfriend was looking at the Cassiopeian readings the other day and they were talking about science and how science got corrupted. And they were talking about how it got corrupted just enough um, to where some stuff made sense, but it would block. Like there, it, would, it was. And we were anyway. We were walking yesterday around the Georgia Tech campus, which is a very swanky school here in Atlanta, and it's very sciencey school. And I just started laughing. I was like, "All these kids are paying all this money for fake science." <laughs> like I just, you well, know, that's the thing. you have to to understand too that. You know, for those 70,000 years and even, you know, in the time during Egypt, religion, science, spirituality, they were all the same. And, the and, the same and, now, and now it's being echoed by some of our spiritual teachers, you know, that we have to have spirituality and science merged together so that we get the whole picture. Because you see science, you get half of it. You get spirituality, you get the one half of it. But with the emergence of quantum energy, quantum science, quantum physics, all this stuff, things are beginning to make a bit more sense. And so you have to have, you know, someone like myself or one of my peers who who's into 
you know, the spirituality or the woo or some people call it to really make sense to some of science discoveries. I mean, because you can't have one without the other. It doesn't make no, you sense. Can't. You absolutely will not. Yeah, it's um, and that 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 is true in ancient in the ancient times. The doctor and the priest were the same person. Yeah, and we see that with with um, you know, I I'm a huge a huge believer in in like like therapy therapy healing like talk therapy just to kind of yeah. And I, and I know a lot of doctors. Like my my grandfather was a surgeon. He passed away a long time ago, but he used to make fun of therapists. Like he did not understand why people thought. You know, but nowadays it's like we know that everything is psychosomatic. We know the energy of consciousness and stuff, but we've been trained for such yeah. a long time to think that the two are separate, that the body right. is a biological, mechanical thing that has no <laughs> no correlation to the mind, which is so <laughs> like it's such bullshit. There was a book in the late so my my mother, well, I grew up, you know, I was born in nineteen eighty three. I've been thinking about this a lot. I was born in nineteen eighty three. So I was born into a world of jazzercise and low fat diets and my mama uh, some of my earliest memories is sitting in the back of a gym and my mama did step aerobics and jazzercise. Like I remember going to a Weight Watchers meeting with my mama before Thanksgiving and they said, and I'll never forget it. If you gobble, 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 you'll wobble, wobble, wobble. Like I, my whole early childhood was based on like wheat thins and tab, tab, beverage tab. Um, and there was a book that came out in the late 90s. I think it was late 90s that that was it, it was called Think Yourself Thin. And everybody thought it was hysterical. Like, what is this book? And now <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. That's right. Like, think yourself like that. It's your mind. Like, it's all in your mind. If you see yourself, no matter how much exercise you're doing or dieting you're doing, if you see yourself as a fat slob, guess what? The body's just yep. going to respond to that. And that idea of consciousness and that, 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 you know, and science would probably tell you that that's not true, that your thoughts don't yep. affect the outcome of the body. But I'm like, actually, no. They the do. knew that, right? The priest knew that. Yeah. The, you know, so. <laughs> all right, you guys. So I'm going to put all this down in the description box below. Obviously, there'll be a link to our first video in case you missed it. Um, this was our first video was over this. As the law. Yep. James Church. But second video has been over this. All right. And do we want to show the third book already? Oh, no, let it be a surprise. Wait. We'll wait for yeah. that one because we've got yeah. we've got a third book and then we have a guest that we're gonna bring on. Um, we'll get into that surprise guest when we when we actually air the show, you guys. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, so well, thank you so much, Hillis. I just I'm so flattered that you asked me to do this with you because I, I think you and I are just both weirdo nerds at heart. Like we're we're the two that are like, wait a minute, what is this place called Mew? <laughs> like yeah, because I mean, like I said, the reason why I began this show is because. I've been an energy practitioner for almost um, for just over ten years, and been doing yeah. this work, and been attuned to the Mormon energy. And people in, in my circle, my peers, they say, "Have you heard of Moo? Do you know what Moo is?" I'm like, "No, what is Moo?" It's like, "Have you heard of Lemuria? Do you know what Lemuria is?" I'm like, "No, what's that?" And then you know, I tell them about Lemuria. They tell me what Moo is. We say, "Okay, well, it could be Atlantis." And so we just come up with these off the wall conclusions. And so now. You know, I feel it's time for me to really, really know what the truth of all of this is because we have all of this information. You know, whether we tap into it and for people who are psychic like myself or people who do remote viewing, things like that, we can see things. Sometimes we just want validation, you know, like actual evidence. Because when I first started doing what I do, like when you start hearing voices in your head or spirit, you think you're going cuckoo. But you're not. And so it's, it's this learning curve and this adjustment period. But no, it doesn't matter how long you've been doing this. Every psychic that I know, whether they've been doing this for five years, 10 years, 50 years, however long, they still want their piece of validation. So this is kind of like a, almost like a passion project for me, like James Church with this is, you know, I want the, the evidence of what is this? Because I'm attuned to Lemuria energy by way of Sirius. I am, you know, connected to Lemuria. I've been told I was the emperor of Mu. So it's like, you know, I, I just want some validation, people. Well, I, you know, for Hillis, like, I think for a lot of people watching, you know, I, I did pretty well in school. I, you know, I, I loved 
history and literature. And I think I love studying history and literature because I'm nosy, I'm a nosy bitch. And I love to hear what other people are going. I, I literally, I figured it out. This is why I love, this is why I love history and literature. Just in my forties, I figured it out. I'm just a nosy bitch. That's why I love it. Um, <laughs> I'm a petty nosy bitch. Um, but, um, you know, I, when when this whole when all this information started to come out rapidly even though for me i can remember i know history like the back of my hand i can tell you all about all the historical events but even with like tartaria information and the fact that our historical timeline might not be right that feels the alternative timeline even though i'm very well versed in the official narrative the alternative timeline feels right it feels yeah. right to me yeah. it's not you not the stuff that yeah. we d did in school you know and I will say that in close to the end of the book, he does talk about Tartaria. He talks about it a little bit in the continent. Uh, yeah. yeah, just yeah. a little bit. So that's and what part, I like. That's about. a very, you know, Tartaria is a very new concept for a lot of people. It's just recently come out down on the grand whole of what Tartaria was. And, yeah. you know, so I think, I think if this is doing these episodes, tell us, I don't want to speak. We got some great responses from our videos. And I thank you guys, because I think a lot of our friends watching right now are kind of the same as us. Like, something's not right. Something isn't right. A lot of things are not adding up. Math isn't mathing right now. And so, <laughs> two you know, plus two is five now. Do what? Two plus two is five now. I know, right? Math isn't mathing at all anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so did you guys know that two plus, I would have failed kindergarten if I was back in school because two plus two is five now. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, this is very, and, and again, I, I want to make this clear too. James Churchwood also, and somebody brought, maybe it was Billy Carson, I forgot who brought this up with these alternative researchers. You know, like James Churchwood or Graham Hancock, more modern day, or Billy Carson. You know, a lot of these guys are working with what they have. Do they? Do these guys have it 100% correct? Probably not. They're probably, they're, but they're, are they like 90% correct? Probably. Yeah. Because, so, so, you know, because they're, they're, they're working against the grain. Right. We have to, I have so much respect for James Churchwood because especially in his time, in his time, especially like, it's kind of cool to be a weirdo now. Like we're in our, our prime right now. It's kind of cool to be woo woo and be kind of weird now. But back then he was hated. He was considered bash it crazy because yeah. he was going against everything that we had been taught was real. And yeah. so my respect, mad respect to him. Yeah, I mean, and, and and honestly, I can see why they chose Africa as the motherland, because it was an established land and an established colony of Mu. Yeah. And there was proof of it being older than anything else. Yeah. So all the proof led to say, okay, Africa's the motherland. Stamp. Yeah, that's that's it. the end of story. That and I, I also too think with Africa, I've spent some time in Africa, and there is a wildness to that con continent that you don't feel. And I'm not saying that same wildness doesn't exist in other continents, guys. I mean, let's be real: man versus nature. Nature will always win, whether you're in the middle of the Sahara Desert or you're in the middle of like Shanghai. If nature's gonna nature, it's gonna nature, and you're just shit out of luck, right? But there is kind of a wildness to Africa that you just feel. And I think with the whole narrative of evolution that we came from monkeys that they tried to sell us, because obviously this completely throws that out the, the you know, if we're looking at Mew as 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 legitimate, if we're entertaining that as a legitimate timeline, then there's no evil there's no you know, evolution. No. Totally, it's it's not. We didn't come from a different species, right? We, you right. know. I mean, if if you if we're going by the story of the tree of life, the tree on the serpent, yeah, sun, water, life, matter, yeah, yeah. And so, and I've never, I've always felt, even you know, even when I was a kid studying it, and kind of was like, well, okay, if that's what the scientists say, I never kind of felt totally comfortable. Like that just never made sense. How can species... Yeah, I mean, it never made sense to me either that we evolved from monkeys. But like I said, if we, if we go back to the story of how Mu and Bidin and the savagery exactly. and, yep. and and cannibalism in Burma, of course, is going to de-evolve you know, the body and the senses and, that's, and this is why they found what they found in Europe versus what they could have found in North America at the same time, which they didn't want to study. Yeah. When you have when you when you want to look at one thing, you know, and this is this is how subjective everything is. So guys, I want you to just keep this mind. Everything in the world 
is subjective. There's always going to be something in alignment with your view and something that's not in, in alignment with your view. Yeah. And of course, you're always going to gravitate to something that's in alignment with your view because it, it gives you that, that confidence. It gives you that, 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 that validity. But yeah. when you have confidence and validity in something that is in alignment with your view, of course, that's the, the way you're going to lean as opposed to removing your emotions from it and just looking at the facts. And when you move your emotions from it, whether it's right or wrong, is it is what it is, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's um, you know, I think too, like to think, you know, I always had this question too. I remember asking this when I was like in the seventh grade. I because I think I wanted to see it. I was like, if evolution happened, where why aren't monkeys still evolving? Like I want to see I want to see that. Like, who doesn't want to see that? Like, that's, that's a train wreck. Let's see that, you know, and it's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's just, but then all of a sudden, you know, it was the first time I was really confronted with, with, um, the nefarious powers that be in some of these organizations is when I covered the giants and I covered some lawsuits against, I'm not going to say the name on YouTube because that got me a, in trouble last time. The institution starts with an F an S it ends with an Onion. And um, they are nonprofits supposed to fund fund archaeologists to do research into our history, our archaeological history. And some archaeologists had sent some giant bones to the starts with an S, ends with an onion. And the starts with an S, ends with an onion, incinerated the fossils once they got them. And so these archaeologists, this is, this is, y'all, a lot of my research I do, I look at lawsuits because this, because lawsuits are petty. They're freaking petty. Like, I love reading lawsuits. And these archaeologists had sued the starts with an S, ends with an Onion. And the defense was, their defense, they acknowledged that they did incinerate these fossils because their job is to support the official narrative. So even looking at giants, if we acknowledge, so the starts with an N, S, ends with an Onion acknowledges that we have fossils of human beings that all over the world that were like 25 feet tall, then obviously common sense means we didn't evolve from monkeys. Yeah, I mean, there, there has yet to be anything that I've read from James Churchwood about that, but I find that fascinating, you know, but like I said, you know, it's all, in, it's all about your perspective and what you yeah. want to believe in and what, and what you want to align to. Now, thank you guys so much for taking time out of your day or a couple of days to watch this because I know it's a lot to take in at one time. And like I said, just go and do your own research. Go in and do do your due diligence, diligence because it's very rewarding. And you may, you know, contact me and uncover something that I've looked over, something that I've forgotten, yeah. and I will let you know. But there are three more books in the series. So there's going to be at least three, four more of these coming. Who knows? As long as you want. It's so fascinating. It's so, so fascinating. I agree, too. Multiple. That's why I opened my channel. All I say is because I wanted to deep dive weird and wacky stories. And I wanted to be able to talk to my audience of other people who are also weird and wacky and we can have conversations about it because you're right, Hillis, there's so many things I, Hillis and I could read the same book and I might see something he doesn't see and he might see something I don't see. So we need each other. We need each other. Yeah. So yes. Yeah. As yeah. Guys get these books as yeah, remember if this is overwhelming for you, just remember it's a sign of an intelligent mind. If you can entertain an idea without accepting it. And mm -hmm. I would say the most important information I think we get from this book, Hillis is that, we all come from the same source. Yeah. We're all we're all brothers and sisters. Yeah. Don't worry yeah, about that. The third commandment, I believe. <laughs> we'll have to go back and look. We're all brothers and sisters. We're we all come from the same source, whether it's the source of God or the source of Mu. We all come. We're all equal in the eyes of God, and we're all on this. I don't know if it's a floating rock or a floating disc, whatever we're on. That's another topic for another day. <laughs> so, and God is within you. You you don't need a religion. You don't need a priest. You don't need, we are all, you're fine. You're not going to go to hell. You're totally fine. And there is no hell. It was made up. It's made up, you guys. Why Why would a loving God that created you as, as a child then send you to the pits of hell because 
to burn forever. Burn forever in eternity because you picked the wrong flavor of religion. That he wouldn't. And so I, if that's the biggest thing in my channel or this deep dive or anything has brought anybody is please take that burden off your shoulder. I want every person watching this to know that you are a precious human being. You are precious. You are a fractal of God. Yeah. Your soul is eternal. And yeah. you are you are created by the source of love and you are that source of love. And so do not let these nefarious ones convince you otherwise. Yeah. Think yourself thin. No, I'm, just <laughs> I'm gonna find that book. I'm gonna find that book. Um, so anyway, you guys. Well, I thank you, Hillis, and I cannot wait to see the comments from our friends watching, watching um this when this airs. I'm gonna edit it and put some pictures in. So I'll, I'll I don't know when it's gonna air yet, but if you're watching this, obviously it has aired. So all right, you guys. Well, I hope you have a fabulous, fabulous day. You're a badass. You're a fractal of God, and you are love. Don't let and you're 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 a child of Mew. <laughs> you're a child of Mew. Start really confusing people when you go to a job interview or a date. Just be like, yeah, I'm a child of Mew, and so are you. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, you guys. Well, we will talk to you later. I'll put Hillis's links will also be in the description box, guys. Do please make sure you subscribe to Hillis's channel as well. All right, bye everybody. <laughs>